KCBS Radio, original podcasts. Even though the official investigation into Jane's death had ended, the doctors who witnessed her demise in Hawaii refused to be silenced. David Starr Jordan would continue to fight back in the press, insisting that she had died a natural death and offering up other explanations for the poison found in her medicine. At one point, he lays suspicion on the doctors, claiming that one of them had put poison in the bottle himself. Meanwhile, that spring, he gives the commencement address to Stanford's graduating class of 250 men and women, laying on thick his devotion to the university to his captive audience. He intended to take a six-month-long trip abroad afterward, but it was cut short due to the consistent outcry from the doctors. A nephew of Leland Stanford's put out a call for information into Jane's death, offering a $1,000 reward to find and convict his aunt's murderer. A re-examination of Jane's heart and other organs was conducted by a team headed by a doctor being considered for the post of dean of Stanford's first medical school. This doctor concluded her likely cause of death was myocarditis, although the official report was lost. A year after her death, this doctor was paid $1,000 by her estate. The suspicion, intrigue, and accusations seemed destined not to die nearly as quickly as Jane herself had. Whatever could get in the way had to be something far bigger, an act of God. From KCBS Radio and Odyssey, I'm Natalia Gurevich, and this is Bitter Academia, Episode 6, The Ashes. An act of God. That is exactly what the Bay Area would get. Well, this was a time when people didn't even understand that an earthquake was the sudden movement of two pieces of earth past each other. So at the turn of the century, people thought earthquakes were some kind of explosion or implosion underground. And uh, they had no idea that California was laced with faults that could produce earthquakes like this. On April 18th, 1906, a little over a year after Jane's death, the Bay Area was leveled by an earthquake rivaled only by another one more than 80 years later, the Loma Prieta earthquake. While that earthquake lasted 10 to 15 seconds, the 1906 earthquake lasted around two minutes. That may seem short to us, but during an earthquake, two minutes can be catastrophic. And the damage stretched down about 350 miles of California's coast. Chaos rained down on San Francisco as streets cracked open, buildings crumbled, and people were left to grapple with the destruction of their fledgling city. And whatever wasn't destroyed by the quake would go up in flames. When I give talks about the earthquake, I read a beautiful passage from Jack London because, you know, he's a great writer and he was... This is Ross Stein, a geophysicist, CEO, and co-founder of Tembler, a seismic risk calculation app. He is also, of course, a geophysics lecturer at Stanford. Ross was about to embark on a long international trip, so we spoke by Zoom the day before he left. Jack London is a famous writer known for his stories sailing on the San Francisco Bay. There's a square in Oakland named after him. Collier's Magazine asked him to write about the quake right after it happened. And this is the account Ross is referring to. He's sitting on the, on the stoop with a man, and the man says... Uh, take a look. He takes him into the house and he said, look at this China collection, that uh, my wife's China collection. He said, look at this rug. He said, it came from India. It cost $15,000. He said, there are no horses. He said, all of this will go. Everything is going to go. And he was right. Everything ultimately burned. It's difficult to separate the impact of the earthquake shaking and the damage that, that caused and the fires that were that started as a result largely of people camping out because they couldn't live in their buildings and those things catching fire in the city is really dense. Nothing would 
ever be the same. And the worst part? Some knew this was going to happen. There had been another large earthquake before 1906, in 1868. Oh. And the amazing story there is that uh, this was known as the Great San Francisco Earthquake until 1906 because it wiped out the city. And this is a city that you probably know, due to the gold rush, went from 15,000 people to 150,000 in the space of a year and burned to the ground three times in its first five years. Wow, okay. Completely to the ground. So this was already a place of convulsion and rapid change. It, this 1868 earthquake, nobody had any idea what the cause was. So a businessman, a local businessman, created a fund that citizens could support to hire scientists from the East Coast to come and study it. He raised a lot of money. They studied this earthquake. They found the Hayward Fault. They found other faults. And they said, this is probably not a one-off. This is probably something in California's future. And the guy who whose name escapes me, George something, who put this together, got the report and said, this is bad for business, and he burned it. And nobody ever saw the report. When did this happen? 1868, so it was about 1870 when he burned the report. And everybody paid for this. So people were furious, and then he died. And as a the report has never been found, but the authors of the report talked about it on their deathbeds. So in other words, the impact of the 1906 earthquake could have been foretold had this information got to people. But you know, that was a time that, hey, if there was a typewriter, then there were two copies and it was relatively easy to destroy compared to today. Since this information was kept under wraps, no one in the city was prepared for the disaster. None of the buildings had been built properly to prevent collapse during an earthquake. I asked Ross to describe to me what changes need to be made in order to make a building earthquake safe. He was obliging enough to whip out a handy model for a visual demonstration. The model was simple enough. A set of rods connected together to form two cubes, stacked on top of one another. But the problem with a building built out of a cube is it has no structural integrity. And this is what an earthquake does. It just pushes the ground sideways. Mostly it's sideways like this and it adds torsion. Ross holds the cubes from the base and shakes them. The cubes bend and sway in his hand, performing a little wiggle. You can see how weak this building is. And if any one of these, it's basically, the problem is that no matter how strong you make the columns and beams, it's the corners that hold the building together. Yeah. And if any of the corners breaks, this building's going down. The solution to this problem is actually incredibly simple, according to Ross. In the corners of the cube, additional rods, or in case of a building, beams, should be added to make tiny triangles. And the solution is to put in triangles, not cubes. And these triangles hold, make the corners strong. So here's the exact same building, but as all I've done is I've snapped in these little corner braces with sewing snaps. Yeah. Now look. Wow. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> okay, here's the shocker. Guess how much more expensive it is to go from this building to this building? I'm guessing not a lot. Like 2%. Wow. For a house, it's the cost of a half bathroom. And it, it, it was something that could be done then and is something that can be done now. So if people had understood the construction style of the campus and San Francisco at large would have been much different. This wasn't the case, of course. Most of the buildings that were built at that time did not have these adjustments. And it wasn't just the buildings that were the problem in San Francisco. It was the way the city itself was built, right around the gold rush in the middle of the 19th century. What people did, these ships would come in, drop anchor in uh, Yerba Buena Cove, which is today the financial district. Yeah. People would race off the boats to get in steamships to go to Sacramento and then to start working into the gold rush. And so would the crews of the sailboats, the sailing ships, because the wages of a miner were 10 times higher than the wages of a sailor. So all these ships, the most lucrative 
merchant marine route in the world were all one-way ships. None of these ships were ever sailed home. Wow. They just rotted in the bay. They dropped anchor, fell apart, were abandoned, and ultimately what the San Franciscans did is make a railroad from Golden Gate Park to downtown, dumping sand on top of those ships until it made land, and that's what the financial district is. Oh, okay. That's what it is. It's just the rotting carcasses of gold rush ships with a little bit of sand thrown on top. <laughs> same for the marina, and pretty much same for uh, Soma, oh. which was a estuary. So those are San Francisco's Achilles heels. Any earthquake, they get trashed. Loma Prieta, the marina was trashed and burned because it's junk land. Stanford University wasn't built on junk land. But the school faced another problem with the material used for its buildings, sandstone. While the material proved stylish and kept buildings cool in the summer, the material was not particularly sturdy. And as one might expect with a sand castle in the wake of the ocean, it crumbled during the quake. The buildings that Jane Stanford had so lovingly erected on her campus, the memorial arch, the church, collapsed. Her Stone Age, as her detractors mocked her for, were destroyed just over a year after her death, which only led to fresh criticisms about her stylistic choices. But she achieved something while building the campus that granted her one last trailblazing designation, which became especially evident after the earthquake. Jane Stanford built the first reinforced building west of the Mississippi, which is the Stanford Museum. Really? Yes. I mean, she was going to put her art in there, right? She wanted a fireproof, earthquake-safe building. She understood that, right? Okay. But structural engineering's in its infancy before 1906. This is Laura Jones again, Stanford's archaeologist. The, the steel reinforced concrete was patented. Really? By okay. a man named Ransom. And, uh, and so you had to pay a patent fee to him to do it. And so you'll see the Ernest Ransom patent stamp on that building. Jane couldn't afford the patent fee for the additional wings of the building or for any other buildings at the time. This was when the government was suing her for $15 million. But the center of the art museum, where Leland Jr.'s art was kept, was safe. The museum, the most precious vestige of her son's legacy, escaped relatively unscathed. The same could not be said for everything else Jane held dear in the Bay Area. Her home on Knob Hill, her home in Palo Alto, none of it survived. However, there was a place that Jane had once called home that still exists to this day. It has been lovingly, painstakingly preserved, far from the destruction in the Bay Area, in our state capital, Sacramento. On a tree-lined street in the heart of the city's downtown, just a block from the Capitol building, a Victorian mansion sits behind a quaint little fence. Fruit trees and rose bushes fill out a lush garden with a white and black checkerboard stone walkway. Surrounded on all sides by large, corporate-looking offices and construction in progress, the house definitely feels out of place. But the Leland Stanford mansion has been kept intact for years by the California State Park System and still serves today as a reception center for state government and is one of the California governor's workplaces. If you remember, Leland Stanford served as governor of California from 1862 to 1863. Before the day was over, my podcast manager, Matt, would sit at Arnold Schwarzenegger's old desk. But that's not why I'm there. To Jane, her family meant everything. It's at the root of what drove her, her husband and her son. With her other two homes gone the way of history, this house is the last vestige of her personal life, in physical form. This is the house where Leland Jr. was born, her first years of motherhood. Standing outside the house, it is clearly a Gilded Age mansion, with its ornate gold-colored trim covering the roof and windows, the curved staircase leading up to the entryway. I could picture Jane welcoming her guests for a party when she was playing the dutiful governor's wife, but it didn't always look this way. 
The home was actually quite modest when it was first built, but Jane and Leland, with his railroad fortune, remodeled it twice while they lived there. We'd learned the extent of the work from our guide, Megan Stanley, a petite young woman who proved to be a good sport as we shoved our microphones in her face during our private tour. So this is actually, we are in the 1856 structure right now. So the original house was a 2,000 square foot home that looked kind of like this Eastern Row house right here. This is actually the house she grew up in in New York. It is no longer there. I looked it up on Google. <laughs> but um, we do luckily have an image of it. Megan is referring to a painting on the wall of the house's foyer. It's like she describes a simple white row house. So when he expanded the house to the size you're seeing it today, they spent $50,000 to expand it to this size. Wow. Now to do what they did, they actually had to lift the house up. So that original floor, that, that floor below us is actually from 1872, where this is all from the 1850s. Wow. Okay. So they used jack screws in order to lift the house up 12 feet to build that lower floor. And so if you've changed a tire on your car, you understand the concept. Instead of pumping, you're having to turn. So we estimate probably 60 to 80 men would have been used to, like, uh, all standing at a jack screw, all turning at the exact same time. Okay. Now, they can only go up about two inches a day because they have to make sure the structure is going to be sound as mm -hmm. it's being lifted. Yeah. But once they get it up that 12 feet, you know, they're stacking cribbing blocks underneath to hold the original house up. They can build the walls, set the house back down. So did Leland do that to appease Jane, like the original uh, no, builder? Just the <laughs> he, I, he, they basically did it because as their wealth and status grew, they felt they needed a larger home. 1868, they have Junior as well, and so they're wanting to expand for that. But oddly enough, two years after completing this house to the size you see it today, they start construction on a 60,000 square foot mansion in San Francisco on Knob Hill. That's right. So, <laughs> um, but that was because the railroad headquarters moved up there, so Central Pacific. The home has been carefully preserved over the years. The wooden staircase banister is brightly polished. The art hanging on the walls has been matched almost exactly to photographs of the house's interior from Jane's day. When certain things couldn't be done exactly the same, like some upholstery on chairs, the staff searched for near-perfect replacements to try to be as authentic as possible. But the restoration is what you're seeing here. The restoration of the house took place after the house closed down in 1986. Um, they did archaeological investigations. They, you know, took layer upon layer of paint off the wall to understand what colors they would have used at the time. You know, they, they just went into everything in this building to understand the time period. So, um, they basically, and plus with those photos we had, we were able to recreate mm -hmm. a lot of what you're seeing. But a lot of this stuff is original. And it the result, walking through the rooms, touching Jane's old vanity in her bedroom, you can almost feel her presence here. But despite Jane's predilection towards spiritualism and some encounters others have had, Megan doesn't think Jane's spirit is in the house. Well, we get flickering lights every now and again. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, we can't really say if that's, you know, spirits or just the electrical wiring is not <laughs> up to par for gas lighting. Because um, these, all these lights were originally gas powered, so probably wiring was not easy. Um, we have had people have experiences here. Um, the old director had mentioned that he had seen a... a a spirit in full Victorian dress down in the ballroom um, one time, um, and we also had a, we've had women come back that lived in the house. I just but think it's interesting because Jane was such an avid spiritualist. Because this was such a a special place for her, and we do you know upstairs sometimes when we're opening up and lights flicker, we'll say good morning, Jane, just pretending she's here, because you know she. I mean, this was a you know her son, the one son, her one and only son she loved so much was born in this house, and I would think she would have a special. Obviously, she did have a special connection with the house. So, mm -hmm. but I, while her death was mysterious, I think you know she's with her family, she's with her son and her husband, and that I think has helped her probably. So she doesn't have the unfinished business. Yes. <laughs> As we walk through the house, the decor is littered with symbols of the Gilded Age. Symbols of abundance and glory, like grapes, sheaves of wheat, 
Symbols were very important during that time period. So you're going to see we have like Bacchus throughout the house or Dionysus, depending on who you, what you want to call it, you know, the god of wine and grapes and that sort of thing, parties. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, you'll see um, here, we can go into the formal parlor because there's a lot of different symbols. We have Corinthian columns in here. And this stuff actually dates to the, some of the stuff dates to the focus is living in the house. I mean, we like to believe, wow. so this is the formal parlor, so the most opulent room that's in the house. And that molding and this arch here is actually from the Fogus home. But I mean, you'll find, you know, those Greek and Roman styles a lot of the time from that time, those in those uh, decorations, in that architecture. A lot of abundance, symbols mm -hmm. of abundance and prosperity, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, Interesting. yeah, so it's, I mean, after a while, I mean, they started out very humbly. I mean, sh they used to make uh, just uh, furniture out of boxes and things they had and cover them. Like, you know, it makes me think of like my parents who had cardboard boxes from their speakers and covered them to be end tables. So, and that's what they used to do. But obviously, if you're, when your wealth grows, you can afford various things. So all the and the Stanfords weren't afraid to show off their wealth. And keeping with the times and with their roles in society, even after Leland was no longer governor, they played host to marvelous parties. February of 1872, they hosted a Victorian ball in this house, supposedly inviting between 700 and 1,000 people into the home. Oh, wow. Mind you, that was throughout the house. It was standing room only. There was, while they did serve dinner, it was all standing room, because really you can't <laughs> sit down no. dinner that many people. <laughs> there was two orchestras, one up here, one downstairs in the ballroom. Um, it's actually completely written about in the newspapers of the time period. Um, they list what Jane wore, what her sister wore, like, not what, did, what did she wear? Um, as far as I remember, it was a kind of lavender colored dress, um, just with the frills and, you know, flowers. They put flowers on their dresses at the time. Um, just the jewelry, I mentioned the jewelry, and as she, I'm, she had a lot of it. But the decor isn't just typical Gilded Age fare, and the house wasn't just a testament to the wealth of the family. We also get a better impression of who the Stanfords really were. Not just Jane but Leland as well. We spent most of our time on the main floor and the floor above, and throughout were personal touches on the furniture, the art, clearly instigated by Leland. Particularly when Megan leads us into one room with dark wood paneling, bookshelves up to the ceiling, and a grand fireplace. So this is not a room that Jane would hang out in. This is the gentleman's parlor. <laughs> ah. oh. So, but we do have some interesting technology that she might have, you know, m played around with because we do find the megalithoscope um, in the sun porch in the picture, and this is a form of entertainment for them. It's it's almost like a projector, but I mean, this is basically the old school viewmaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he was he was like he was a gadget bob. Basically, yeah. I mean, he just had his hands in so many different things. He was interested in so many different things. Mm -hmm. And with, I mean, his wealth all made him able to try, so experiment with so many yeah. different things, which is really kind of neat. I mean, think of if he hadn't experimented with motion picture, the 24 frames per second, where would we be today with movies? I mean, how Leland, if you remember, actually was responsible for the first film on record of a horse galloping. He definitely had an affinity for technology, for horses, and, of course, for railroads, which we could see throughout these rooms. I have to imagine he helped with the design of some of his furniture, because there's a lot of trains incorporated into the furniture. That's not the only one. Although this does look like the Governor Stanford engine that is currently at the Railroad Museum, which is the first engine on the Central Pacific Line. Oh. They named it um, because he was president, Leland Stanford was president at the time, they wanted to have that was the first engine that would be placed on the line, but let me show you the other train things. Okay, okay. To our surprise, Megan crouches down in front of one of the tables in the massive formal dining room and lifts up the tablecloth, drawing our attention to the legs. Intricately carved, I was trying to figure out what they reminded me of when Megan thankfully filled in the gaps. These are trains here. So if you look, this would oh be the smokestack. Oh, this is the body so cool. of the engine. This would be your cow catcher, which is also known as a pilot. And then these are almost like tracks. Oh, I see it. That is so cool. I've never the seen a whole, table like, like this. All four like yep. legs of the table are yeah. intricately carved wooden trains. I need to take a picture of this. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's, 
It's a stunning, and I mean, these are original to the house, and as you can see over in that piece too, I mean, it's the same table. There's actually three of these. The house itself, connected through a series of small hallways and almost imperceptible doors, at times felt like a maze. I had to chalk it up to the countless renovations, and also the ease through which Megan, used to the layout, guided us to particular areas of interest. After the initial overview, Megan took us to the rooms of the subject we were most interested in. Jane. I could tell, with the softer decor and the lighter colors, that we had entered the women's parlor, which was dominated by the most interesting-looking piano I had ever seen. It looked like the topmost layer, the wood surface that keeps the intricacies within hidden, had been peeled back. Layers of wires and mechanisms were exposed, and according to Megan, this design was intentional. Oh, this is so, amazing. Yeah, this is, a Chickering is the first piano to be manufactured in America. This was actually shipped around the Cape. It's called a box grand. And yeah. I know when people hear a grand piano, they think, you know, Steinway, where you get the huge yeah. pump. It's a huge yeah. piano. But the reason it is shaped like this is because it makes it easier to ship it. Because it's coming by ship yeah. to get here. Uh, is he allowed to do yeah. that? I do. <laughs> I always check ask people. I would like a free concert on my tour. I do not know how to play piano. I don't think he does either. <laughs> I've learned how to do the beginning of the Harry Potter thing. Can, can we hear it? Oh, for sure. I'm. Hopefully, I'll get. I don't know how to play it either, but. Fantastic! Beautiful! Beautiful! <laughs> well done! Well done! Gorgeous! <laughs> I mean, I love that you can really just sort of see inside, like, the guts and everything. And they did that because that's the other part of this piano that makes it very interesting, is the lines for the keys actually overlap each other. Mm -hmm. So there's some going one this one way, and there's the other going the other way. You opposite. get a little bit more reverb, and it's yeah. a richer sound. Like, but like, Makes it very hard to tune, though. Like, but, but listen <laughs> to how well this thing is tuned. How yeah. often do you... The design of the piano makes it difficult to tune, but the sound of the instrument was fantastic, even though it likely had last been tuned well before the pandemic. All the rooms, this one included, were connected by a series of tubes that originated in the servants' area of the house. If someone wanted something, all they had to do was speak into the tube's opening, placed very conspicuously in the wall with a silver cover. We walked through the house down an incredibly narrow, high-ceilinged hallway that Megan affectionately calls the Shining Hallway, after the terrifying Stephen King novel and movie. At one end, we come to one of the rooms I was most interested in seeing. This is Jane's bedroom, and this is the room that made the house so special to her, because this is where she gave birth to Junior. And this is all her original furnishings, meaning this is the bed she gave birth to Junior on. The bed is beautifully carved with a canopy above it, Jane's bedroom is lovely and comfortable, not as opulent as I think I was expecting. But there were the expected floral patterns and soft colors typical for a woman's room at the time. Right, you can definitely, it feels very delicate in here, but it's still, it's its not also delicate. I don't know how it's to describe it. very stately. Yeah, and I mean, that is, it's just a beautiful room. The biggest indication of luxury in the room was the functioning master bathroom, complete with a flushable toilet. Goodness, the height of luxury. They were actually one of the first homes to have hot and cold running water in the house. Ever or just in Sacramento? In Sacramento. Okay, I was gonna say. <laughs> in Sacramento. Um, but they could afford to hook up the lines. There was a cistern on the back of the house. Next to Jane's bedroom is, of course, Leland Jr.'s first room. It's tiny and was likely before his birth a sewing room. A beautifully carved wooden crib toys scattered on the floor, including, of course, a steam engine, depict what seemed like a very happy childhood. Leland Jr. grew up in this house until he was about six or seven years old, where after the Stanfords moved to San Francisco. Their other homes have been lost to time, but their memories are still alive here. It made me wonder how Jane viewed this house after Leland Jr.'s death, after her husband's death as well. Did she feel joy from the memories seeped into these walls? Or did the regret about what could have been haunt her instead? I like to believe it's the former. After all, Jane didn't view death as the end. 
It might be wishful thinking, but I think it made her happy, especially based on what she eventually decided to do with the grand, now empty house. She, a mother without her child, wanted to provide a home for girls without mothers. So early 1900s, the Sisters of Mercy ran the house. She requested them, not because she was Catholic, but because of the care the Sisters of Mercy gave Junior when he was struggling with typhoid in Europe um, and Italy. So, um, And then in 1936, it switched over to the Sisters of Social Service, and they cared for the home until it closed down in 1986. So surprisingly, it was actually used much longer for a, as a girl's home or children's home than it ever was the Stanford's home. Evidence of the home's second life as an orphanage for girls has been preserved just as much as the Stanford's were. A dormitory-style room with metal bed frames is divided in two, one half slightly more modern and the other in the style of the turn of the century. These two depictions represent the two iterations of the orphanage Megan described. The staff still find evidence of the young girls that lived in this house, like carvings on the walls or notes stuffed into the speaking tubes. When it was first turned into a girl's home, it was called the Stanford Lathrop Home for Friendless Children. But according to Megan, friendless back then meant something different than it does today. Back then, it meant you had no family. So if these girls were friendless, in a way, so was Jane. And she was able to give them something that she couldn't necessarily get for herself later in her life without paying for it. Companionship. We ended our tour in the lower level of the house, the basement. Standing at an old-fashioned billiards table, Megan revealed that Jane herself had been a very good player, showing us a picture of her and her sister with pool cues. So basically, <laughs> uh, she was a, a pool shark. Okay, I love that. Was that not, that probably wasn't a common hobby at the time. No, I don't think so. I mean, it, one time I did read that they did have leagues for women at the time, but it's not something obviously that would be, I think, quite common to do out. This little detail struck me. Again, so much has been written about Jane, but I feel like there isn't nearly enough that captures her, not just the image of her that's been cultivated over time. And I appreciated Megan for being able to offer more of a glimpse into Jane's personal life. Megan wasn't our tour guide by accident. When I reached out to the Stanford mansion, I asked for someone who is also interested in Jane's history with the house. So with this in mind, I asked Megan when we reached the end of our tour, standing by that pool table, what her thoughts were about Jane's death. Every now and again, it comes up and, you know, we've all done our research and people have different ways of explaining what happened. Um, but it is an interesting topic to discuss when someone actually does want to talk about it. I was interested to hear what she thought, because when Laura Jones, Stanford's archaeologist, asked the mansion staff about it in 2003, they insisted it wasn't poison. So you've done your research. So what's uh, what's your theory? Honestly, I'm... <sighs> To me, what I've been with everything I've been read, I feel like there's no, especially since there's no definitive evidence anymore, whether it's been destroyed for some reason. Um, and I was going over it knowing I was going to be talking with you guys, and I was reading more, and I was like, there's really no way for us to actually tell because strychnine was used at a time, you know, for various pulmonary ailments. And so, but they didn't actually discover enough in her system to actually say, hey, she was poisoned. I also know she, just, they say Stanford passed away because he had a, he over eight the night before. And she kind of did the same thing. If you read the story, she ate a lot. So, and I know she had a lot of, they both had a lot of health issues. But um, I can't say whether she was poisoned or not. I don't know. Um, I, I definitely, you know, when you're reading it at first, it definitely sounds like she could have been. I mean, because there's that whole episode in San Francisco. Um, but I, I, you know, leave it up to everyone to make their own decision. They have to read the stories, the, the information that's there. And I mean, I don't think anyone's ever going to know.
As we left the house, that's the last physical remnant of Jane's personal life, I had to admit the truth to myself. Megan is right. Unless someone wrote a deathbed confession that's hidden in someone's attic somewhere, I doubt we will ever know. But here is what we do know. Jane died under suspicious circumstances in Hawaii in 1905. Her secretary and companion, Bertha Burner, was present at this death and at the poisoning attempt a month before. Bertha changed her account of Jane's final night several times to investigators. David Starr Jordan commissioned a separate autopsy report that he never published, but said proved Jane died of natural causes. Stanford University suffered severe damages during the 1906 earthquake, but managed to rebuild and persevere, becoming one of the most prestigious schools in the world. In recent years, the school has distanced itself from David Starr Jordan for his belief in eugenics. In contrast, the university has embraced Jane even further, recently renaming one of its major throughways after her. In 1905, Bertha retreated to her Menlo Park home. Her sickly mother died just a few months later that year. Bertha would go on to live in that home with her brother in relative obscurity. David Starr Jordan would reconstruct Jane's image, literally, into a booklet he'd disseminate a few years later called The Story of a Good Woman. This narrative would leave out all the unsavory elements of their relationship and her spiritualism instead focusing on her charitable role as an icon in higher education. In 1913, he was booted from his role as president and given an honorific title. Bertha died alone in 1945, without much left to her name except for her book published a decade earlier, Mrs. Leland Stanford, An Intimate Account. Like David, she twisted Jane's story to better suit her own. Jane Stanford was never able to choose how she was remembered by the people that came after her. Those who have studied her, written about her, lived with her memory persisting in their family even today. I set out with this podcast as one of those people. But as close as I tried to get to Jane's story, I still came up short. But maybe it worked out better this way. Jane never asked to be remembered. She wanted her son and her husband to take center stage. But as she fulfilled a role she also didn't ask for, she overshadowed them, and in doing so, offered up her story. Jane's descendant, Dyer Stickney, can only remember what his mother, who knew Jane when she was a girl, told him. So, in terms of then Jane, did your mom talk often about her? Not that I can recall with a certain other than, than she was a kind person. Yeah. And she seemed to, to have a, a mechanics about her that uh, commanded respect in as much as forward moving, making things happen. In the end, that might be the best that any of us can hope for. That we're remembered after we're gone for being kind. Or, best case scenario, visionary. Not all of us can have the proof that Jane does, still standing more than a century later. For Dyer, Jane was a good woman. To some, she was a lonely, cruel spinster who used money to get her way and control those around her. To others, she was a philanthropic visionary and secret feminist who redefined higher education in the West. To others still, she was a woman consumed by grief for the loss of her only child, obsessed with the afterlife. I don't know if any of these depictions are fair. She might have been all of these things, or none, or so much more. For me, she was so much more. I think she was so much more than we will ever be able to understand. Perhaps she would have preferred it that way.
Bitter Academia is an Odyssey original podcast, researched, reported, written, and narrated by me, Natalia Gravich. Edited by Myron Kaplan and Matt Pittman. Production, engineering, and sound design by Matt Pittman. Myron Kaplan is Odyssey's managing producer for national podcasts. Please rate, review, and subscribe to Bitter Academia on the Odyssey app or wherever you listen.